Hello, welcome to today's lesson on covalent naming or naming covalent compounds. The question of the day, what are a few ways that you can distinguish ionic and covalent bonds? Just a quick look back, any compound that has covalent bonds is going to be made of nonmetals that share their electrons. And we have some examples. NH3 is called ammonia. CO2, you may know is carbon dioxide, and I'm sure H2O, you know, is water. These are the scientific names for the compounds that I just told you. Um, so NH3, even though we call it ammonia, and even though H2O is called water, those are its common names. So really what that means is that it's the name that normal, regular people use in the everyday world. Ammonia is often used for cleaning. It's the primary component of Windex, if you've ever used that. Um, it has a very significant smell. I'm sure if you've ever cleaned with it, you can remember the smell of ammonia. Well, ammonia is the English term for the compound NH3. In other languages, it's not called ammonia. It has a different name in that different language. And same with water. Um, water, as strange as it may sound, is a common name. Um, in English, we use water. In um, Spanish, it's agua. So the name of the compound is going to change based on the language that you speak. So chemists, just like we had mentioned in the ionic bonding or in the ionic naming lesson, they have kind of like a set of rules for how they're going to name compounds so that no matter what language we speak, we can all come to the same conclusion of what the compound is. So the true IUPAC scientific name for ammonia is nitrogen trihydride. Carbon dioxide, we use its common or we use its um, chemical IUPAC name all the time. And then water is actually called dihydrogen monoxide. Think of how scary that sounds. <laughs> if you struggled at all with naming ionic compounds, naming covalent compounds is going to feel like a breath of fresh air because all you need to do is count. Yes, it is that simple. Um, we are going to count the atoms to come up with their specific chemical IUPAC name. Let's take a look at these again. Nitrogen trihydride. What does that really tell you? It tells you there's a nitrogen and it tells you that there are three hydrogens. It tells you the formula. Carbon dioxide. I know bi is often the prefix that we use for two, but in chemistry we use di. Carbon dioxide tells you there's a carbon and two oxygens. Dihydrogen monoxide. Dihydrogen tells you there's two hydrogens and monoxide, think of the prefix mono, tells you there's just one oxygen. You're going to love this. We're talking specifically about naming binary covalent compounds, meaning that we're working with a compound that has just two elements in it. Um, there are more naming rules depending on if your compound has organic bonds or if it's an organic compound. That has a separate set of naming rules that I'll get to way later. But for now, we're just talking about inorganic binary compounds. So um, the second element, just like in ionic bonding, is going to have its name changed to Ide. The ending of its name it will change to Ide. Think of carbon dioxide, nitrogen trihydride, dihydrogen monoxide. Again, the Ide is going to tell you that this element is bonded. And in this case, um, the element that comes second is going to change its name when it gets married. Now, I know I said it was super easy, but there are just a few weird things to look out for. So if you have a compound like carbon dioxide, CO2, and you only have one atom of the first element, we're not going to use the prefix mono. We're just going to name the element. It's kind of the same way that we don't use the subscript of one when we have just one atom of that element. Um, that is if we... Okay, so it was CO2, right? Um, there's no one behind the C. If you write C, there's at least one C, right? Um, so we're kind of doing that same thing here, but that rule is only going to apply to the first element. So we're not going to write mono carbon dioxide um, because we don't need to. Just saying carbon dioxide indicates that there's one carbon. 
Carbon monoxide, if you follow the rules um, of just using prefixes, you would wind up with a double vowel. So you would wind up with um, carbon monoxide, which um, sounds kind of silly. I don't know how chemists have decided that the double vowel was just too silly to keep. Um, but in this case, we are just going to use mon instead of mono. But sometimes you will see mono. Um, like if you had a chlorine, it would be a monochloride. You would use the full prefix. But if you're going to wind up with a double vowel from using a prefix, you're going to drop whichever one kind of makes it sound silly. <laughs> in this case, you would just drop one of the O's. After going through those little blips, you may be wondering what prefixes are we actually using? Some of these don't sound very uh, familiar to me. Well, here they are. The prefixes 1 through 10 for naming inorganic binary covalent compounds are as follows. If you have just one atom of that element, you would use the prefix mono. 2 is di. 3 is tri. 4 is a little weird with tetra. I know in geometry you would call it a quadrilateral, a shape with four sides. But we, uh, I think those are Greek prefixes and we're using Latin prefixes or vice versa. I don't really know which is which. Um, but the way that I think of four being tetra is the game Tetris. If you've ever played the game Tetris, um, it's, it's actually really fun. I enjoy it quite a bit. But the idea is that you have this board and the blocks fall down and you don't want the blocks to climb all the way up to the top. You want to eliminate the blocks as they fall. The game gets faster and faster and the more blocks you eliminate at once, the more points you get. Well, if you pay attention in the game Tetris, the blocks that fall are like five or six different shapes, and they are made of four blocks each. So you'll have a big block of a square that's a two by two. You'll have a block that is a four by one. It's just like a long, skinny set of blocks. You'll have some that are like zigzag shaped. You have one that's like three on the bottom and one stacked on the top. Every single one of the pieces that falls is built out of four blocks, hence the name Tetris, like Tetra. Um, and then the rest of these you may remember from geometry. They kind of line up, the Greek and the Latin line up very well. So five is penta, six is hexa, seven is hepta. I know sometimes you'll see it as septa, um, but in this case it's hepta with an H. And then we have octa, nona, and deca. So really it's just one through four that maybe you need to familiarize yourself with because the rest of them I'm sure you've heard before. Take a look at these compounds and see if you can come up with their IUPAC names. First up, we have bromine pentachloride. We are not putting mono on the first element, so just stating bromine indicates that there's only one bromine. And then we have five chlorines, pentachloride. The same mono rule is going to apply in the compound SO3, that is sulfur trioxide. Then we have P2O3, which would be diphosphorus, indicating we have two phosphoruses, <laughs> two phosphori, and we have three oxygens, so diphosphorus trioxide. And I know that it sounds really silly to just say diphosphorus. Um, because it's the full name of the element, you're just like putting a prefix on it, but that's what we've decided for covalent bonds. I couldn't tell you why. Um, then we have AS3P5, that is triarsenic pentaphosphide. And this one's a little bit weird because arsenic is actually a metalloid. Metalloids, uh, you may remember, will sometimes act like metals and other times they act like nonmetals. A lot of the time, um, metals are going to participate, I'm sorry, a lot of the time metalloids are going to participate in covalent bonding. And um, when they do that, they will be the um, central atom is what we call them. So your arsenic is going to be kind of in the middle with the phosphides around it. Um, <laughs> when you are a high school chemistry student, it can sometimes be hard to decide whether it's acting like a metal or a non-metal, which is part of the reason why we love the naming system. If you have prefixes in the name, then you can know that this is bonding with covalent bonds. Arsenic is sharing electrons with phosphorus in the case of triarsenic pentaphosphide. If you had something like 
um, arsenic and phosphorus ionically bonding, they would crisscross and it would just be called arsenic phosphide. In that case, you would know that it's a uh, it's an ionic bond because of the way that it's named. So that's part of the reason why we have all of these naming rules, um, because it can give you a clue as to how the electrons are being either transferred or, transferred or shared. Then lastly, we have iodine heptafluoride. Again, no mono on the first element. And then hepta is the prefix for seven fluorines. Now take a look at these and see if you can come up with their formulas. All right, sulfur dioxide. Sulfur is just sulfur. We don't put the prefix on the first element if it is mono. So that's just going to be sulfur dioxide, two oxygens. Then we have dibromine monoxide. So two bromines and one oxygen. And they go in the same order too. Isn't that nice? There's no need to, you know, unscramble, rearrange, nothing like that. Next up, we have diphosphorus pentoxide, two phosphoruses, which remember is P, and then five oxygens, which you have O5. Carbon tetrahydride. This one's really cool. Um, carbon tetrahydride has a few different names. If you are naming it inorganically, carbon tetrahydride would be this right here. Uh, CH4, one carbon and four hydrogens. But you'll see in a future video on organic naming that um, CH4 is actually an organic compound. In the organic naming system, we call it methane. Um, so technically, this is not the best name for CH4, but just for the sake of practice, it's good to have it here. And then lastly, we have sulfur hexachloride. Again, no mono on that sulfur, so it's just one. And hexa is the prefix for six. That's it on covalent naming. Not so bad, right? If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below the video. Subscribe so you don't miss the next one, and I'll see you there.